How are you? Yeah. All right. So welcome to the Science Cafe, which is sponsored by the Ohio University Research Division and the local chapter of Sigma Xi, uh, the Science Honor Society. I am Howard DeWald, the Vice President for the local Sigma Xi and Professor in the Department of Chemistry. And we're delighted you're here today for our final Science Cafe of, of the academic year. Uh, some of you are familiar that we'll be uploading a YouTube video within about 24 hours, which will caption today's presentation, so you can watch it again and again and again, and that's always good. Uh, we do want to thank our IT personnel up above, so Kevin Price, thank you again. We, we always rely upon you, and you do a wonderful job for us. Um, many of you know Roxanne Malay Bruni, who handed you the, the coffee card if you need any further assistance. Um, you're encouraged to, to get in touch with her. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the nature of this, it's interactive. So we encourage you to ask questions during the presentation. And Ronan's done this before, so he's used to getting those questions from everybody. Uh, if you're in the audience, please raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you. Uh, if you're online, uh, Roxanne will be monitoring the chat and ask the question. So today, we have three of our distinguished faculty, Professors Ronan Carroll and Nathan Wayan from the Department of Biological Sciences and Arts and Sciences, and Professor Jane Balbo in the Department of Family Medicine in the Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine. And you can read their title, What Happened to Sexually Transmitted Diseases During COVID? It Might Not Be What You Think. Ronan. Thanks very much, Howard. Thanks, uh, everybody, for coming tonight. And yeah, so we're gonna, we're gonna talk about infectious diseases tonight, but not the one that you're sick to death talking about for the last three years, right? There are, believe it or not, other infectious diseases in the world other than COVID-19. So although COVID is gonna have some impact on what we're talking about tonight, uh, we're, we're gonna talk about something else. So let's start off uh, very quickly with some introductions. So my name is Ronan Carroll. I'm an associate professor in the biological sciences department here at Ohio University. I'm a microbiologist and in my lab, we primarily study the bacteria Staphylococcus aureus. I'm also the associate director of the Infectious and Tropical Diseases Institute at Ohio University. Uh, and then I will hand over and allow my colleagues tonight to do some quick introductions for themselves. Nathan, do you wanna go next? Sure. Uh, so I, my name's Nathan Wyand. I'm an associate professor also in the same department as Ronan. And I've been working on uh, studying Neisseria gonorrhea interactions with uh, human cells for the last 20 plus years. Thanks, Nathan. And Jane, you want to go next? Yeah. My name is Jane Balbo. I'm a family physician. Um, I'm an assistant professor of family medicine at the Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, I, in our curriculum at the medical school, I teach a lot of the STI content, actually with Dr. Aaron Murphy, who's here today too, and um, LGBT health concepts. And then I also practice medicine at the Ohio um, Ohio Health Campus Care at Ohio University, the Student Health Center for OU students. And uh, I wanna make a comment about some of the data that we're gonna see today. So a lot of the data slides come from the CDC and the way that the CDC collects and reports data, they use uh, terms man and woman or men and women and um, they very rarely collect data specifically on using gender identity markers. So when they're talking about men and women, that's the terms that we're going to be using here. But I just want to acknowledge that there are a lot of different ways that people identify with their genders and ways that people uh, interact sexually with different body parts. Um, but the terms that we're going to be talking about today are using CDC data. So we'll be talking mostly about that. Excellent. Thanks very much, Jen. Thanks for, for, for mentioning that. We're also joined here tonight by uh, two members from Equitas Health, uh, who are, if you want to come up to their table afterwards or during the show, you're feel free to, to do that. Um, Equitas Health provides healthcare screening. They provide testing for things like HIV and hepatitis B. Um, so you're welcome to come up and talk with them. We'll talk to them a little bit more at the end as well uh, when, we, when we discuss the issue of testing. Okay, so that's, that's who's here. Uh, now, what are we going to talk about? So... Uh, you may not know this, or maybe you do know this, but April is Sexually Transmitted Infections Awareness Month, 
Uh, and in particular, the, the week of April 9th to 15th, so basically last week, uh, the CDC designates this as their STI Awareness Week, okay, where they uh, try to bring attention to sexually transmitted infections. And I'm going to use sexually transmitted infections and sexually transmitted diseases and sort of interchangeably during this tonight, okay? Um, so the whole purpose of STI Awareness Week, uh, to raise awareness about sexually transmitted infections, or STIs, how they impact our lives, uh, reduce some of the stigma, fear, uh, and discrimination that's associated with it, and hopefully we can kind of contribute a little bit towards that tonight here. Uh, and then ensure people have the tools and knowledge for prevention, testing, and treatment. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things where the more you talk about it, the less, you know, mystique it has, right? So that's sort of part of what we're trying to do here and, and, and raise awareness. So I'm going to start off with just some basic facts and figures about sexually transmitted infections. And obviously there are a wide variety of these. Um, but here are just some kind of overarching or overreaching statistics when it comes to STIs. CDC has estimated that about 20% of the US population, or one in five people, had an STI on any given day in 2018. I don't know about you, but those numbers are a little higher than what I would have expected, right? 20% of the population. So these, these are not uncommon. These are pretty common infections, OK? Uh, and it's been estimated that STIs cost the American healthcare system somewhere in the region of 16 billion, with a B, dollars every year. Okay, so this is a huge impact uh, on the healthcare system. And again, that's just an infographic illustrating some of those points right down there. So, when we talk about STIs, there are a lot of different types of infections. There's a lot of different types of infectious agents. They can be caused by bacteria, they can be caused by viruses, they can be caused by uh, parasites. But there are six nationally notifiable sexually transmitted infections in the United States. So what is a nationally notifiable infection? These are infections where anytime somebody reports or is diagnosed with one of these infections, they have to be reported to the CDC. So that means that the CDC keeps numbers, keeps statistics on these six specific STIs. Now, does that mean these are the only six STIs that are possible? No, absolutely it does not, right? But these are the six that the CDC keeps numbers on and has kept track of for several years right now, okay? So what are our six nationally notifiable STIs? They're listed down here. So we've got HIV, hepatitis B, chancroid, chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. Now I'll bet there's quite a few on here that you've heard of. And possibly one or maybe two on here that you have not. So let's just take a quick look through these six nationally notifiable STIs uh, and talk a little bit about what they are and, and look at some of the infection rates and, and, and uh, incidence numbers, particularly focusing on 2021. So CDC typically works about two or three years behind the, in their data, right? So it takes time to compile and, uh, and get all this data together. And so very recently, as, uh, they released their data for 2020. And that's kind of one of the reasons I became interested in, in, in looking at this and, and presenting this here tonight is, well, as we all know, 2020 was not a normal year, okay? And so I was curious, uh, as maybe you are, and that's why you're here, as to what happened to STI rates during uh, 2020. So let's start off with the viruses, HIV and hepatitis B. And here's a, a quick infographic from CDC showing the overall number of new HIV diagnoses over the last five years. And as you can see, um, going from 2019 into 2020, we see there's a drop, right? So there's been a kind of gradual drop over the last uh, four years, and then a drop from about 36,000 new cases to about 30,000. That's a 17% decrease in new HIV diagnoses going into 2020, okay? So that's what the number of new infections look like. This is a sort of a distribution of those new infections throughout the United States. And it's a, it's a heat map uh, of the United States. And so the darker states are where you're seeing higher incidence, higher prevalence. And so again, you see a lot of uh, higher prevalence in the south. But we see a pretty uh, high level here in Ohio as well. Now, these 30,000 new infections, of course, they're not the only infections, right? People with HIV live a long time. And so if you look nationally at how many people are living with HIV infection in the United States, that number tops over a million people, right? So about 1 million uh, and 72. And again, here is a distribution of, of the different states throughout the United States and where people with HIV uh, are living. And so again, we see a relatively high incidence uh, in the state of Ohio. So that's what HIV looks like. Uh, the next one I'm going to talk about is hepatitis B and hepatitis B virus. Uh, so hepatitis B is, is a form of liver disease. Um, it's transmitted uh, in blood, semen, and other bodily fluids from somebody who's infected. And it's worth mentioning that for some of these STIs that we're talking about tonight, particularly for HIV 
and hepatitis. While they are sexually transmitted, of course, there are other modes with which they can be transmitted through blood and blood products, OK? That's true for some, but it's not true for all of these. And we'll talk a little bit more about transmission uh, as the night progresses. So um, for some people with, with, with hepatitis, it can be a relatively uh, acute short-term illness. Sorry, wrong button. Here we go. Uh, but for others, it can become a long-term chronic infection. And so if we look again at new hepatitis B uh, infections in 2020, you can see compared to 2019, there's a pretty significant drop there yet again. So for both HIV and hepatitis, we're seeing a decrease in the number of newly reported infections in, in 2020. It's worth pointing out here that hepatitis B is, is, has particularly high rates here in the Appalachian region, okay? Uh, we have higher than, than the nationally average uh, number of infections here uh, within Appalachia. Uh, breaking this down state by state, I want to kind of put this up there because I think it really shows something quite interesting. So in this color-coded uh, 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 infographic here, we have a new infections in 2020 in the light green and then infections in 2019 in the dark green. And because it's pretty small in here, I blew it up right down here. This is the state of Ohio. This is the number of infections in Ohio, new infections in 2019 versus the number of new infections in 2020. That looks like a pretty sharp drop. Okay, pretty sharp drop in the number of hepatitis B infections being reported in the state of Ohio in 2020. So there, th th that's kind of an interesting decrease right there. So those are our two viral STIs. Everything after that on this list, chancroid, chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis, these are all bacterial infections. And I'll start off with uh, discussing these by talking a little bit about chancroid, because I'll bet it's probably the one people are least uh, familiar with. The reason that you're probably not that familiar with it is it's exceedingly rare, okay? Chancroid is a very, very rare sexually transmitted disease in the United States. It can be found elsewhere in the world, but typically in the US, you would rarely see more than five to 10 cases a year. In fact, in 2020, there were zero cases reported, and you can clearly see on this graph that since about 2000, there really have not been many infections here. This kind of asks the question, why is this still a nationally notifiable disease? And clearly in the past, it was there were more cases, but why are we still putting this on that, on that, on that list? And, and the reason I think is shown down here. So the bacteria that causes this is Haemophilus ducre, and this bacteria is extraordinarily contagious. Okay, in, the, in, in, in infectious diseases circles, we talk about infectious dose 50 or ID50. ID50 are the number of bacterial cells that you would need to give to someone so that 50% of the population would get sick, right? And the infectious dose 50, the ID50 for H. Ducre is one bacterial cell. So if you had 10 people and you administered one bacterial cell to all 10 of them, 50% of them would get sick and would develop lesions. That's an extraordinarily low dose to cause disease, right? Most infectious agents the infectious dose is much higher than that. And I think this explains why this is still on that nationally notifiable list. Because it could very, very easily happen that a small number of infections with such a high transmissibility rate could very quickly blow up and cause a, a small scale epidemic, which is likely what happened here in the 1990s. Okay? So I think that's why it's still on the nationally notifiable list. But again, something that's not super common. Um, it causes an ulcerative disease, so it causes uh, ulcers uh, around the genitals, particularly painful, but it can also be misdiagnosed and, 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 and it looks like a lot of other uh, ulcerative diseases as well. All right, so that's chancroid. Next we have the, the big three, right? Chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. And so these are amongst the most common sexually transmitted infections in the United States, and they're all caused by different bacteria. And this uh, chart that we're looking at right here is looking at the, the, the number of infections, the number of cases reported to the CDC over the year of 2020. And this is the, uh, the data that kind of got me interested in this and make me want to talk about this tonight. So as you can see at the start of the year for all three of these, you know, they, this is, we're looking at percentage relative to the previous year, okay? So they're all at about 100% at the start of the year. Mid-March, we all remember what happened mid-March 2020, we all went on lockdown, right? Everybody went home and stayed there and nobody left their house for three or four months, right? Uh, and we can very interestingly see this big drop in infections, okay? The number of infections drops around March, but as the year progresses, we start to see that creeping back up. And for both 
gonorrhea and syphilis, we see that at the end of the year, there were a higher number of infections reported than there had been the previous year. And for chlamydia, it's pretty much back up where it started. In fact, it's, it's actually a little bit higher than where it started. So it had increased over the numbers in 2019. When I saw this data, I was a little surprised. I thought, well, hang on a minute. It's, we're in lockdown. Everything's closed. How, how are people having any contact? How are these infections being, being spread? I would have thought we would see a sharp decrease in sexually transmitted infections over the course of 2020. But that definitely doesn't seem to be the case, at least not for these three bacterial infections. But for HIV and for hepatitis B, as you recall, we did see a drop in the number of infectious, uh, new infections reported. So, so there's something funny going on here. Jane, can you help us shed some light on what exactly is happening here? Maybe. <clears throat> yeah, we, we were talking about this data and just thinking about what the potential effects were. So remember that when COVID-19 happened, we realized our public health infrastructure in this country was pretty weak and was not prepared for something like this. And so it was really all hands on deck with people working in public health departments, whether they are city, county, state, et cetera. Um, and so that's one place. And you know what we have to remember about this is this isn't how many people have the, these infections at a given point in time. These are how many infections are reported at a given point in time. And so uh, fewer infections were probably reported because there weren't staff available to make reports. They were busy trying to do contact tracing and you know, enforcing public health rules and things like that. Um, so there's probably some underreporting going on. I know that in many clinical settings, we really, really reduced the number of in-person visits we were having. And so people were probably also not getting tested. So testing is when someone with a symptom has a test done which is different from screening, which is where we recommend doing a test on asymptomatic people on a regular basis so that we can detect things early before they cause problems. So fewer people were getting tested because there were not as many in-person medical visits or they were staying at home, maybe they were just living with symptoms or maybe they were having a video visit with a provider and rather than having them come into the clinic and submit a sample, they were saying, well, you know, this sounds like it could be chlamydia, let's go ahead and treat you for it. And so that was a case that maybe had chlamydia that wasn't ending up getting tested, wasn't ending, ending up getting reported as chlamydia. Um, people were not having their well visits. Uh, we did about six months where the only visits we were doing in person were ones that we really needed to do in person. So a lot of preventive care was getting delayed. And for people who have a vagina and a cervix, that would include recommended yearly chlamydia and gonorrhea screening. So an asymptomatic test um, done yearly on people who have those body parts. Uh, there were limited resources available. I remember there were times when we were told we couldn't do certain certain tests in the clinic because we needed those swabs to do COVID testing. So there were limited supply chain resources available as well. So again, fewer people able to get tested and screened. Um, and then we have on our list here the possibility of social distancing. And you know, for the people who were social distancing but they were still at home, they maybe could have had a partner or a new partner and getting infected, but then not seeking care or not having symptoms, not getting screened, not getting diagnosed, et cetera. So while social distancing may have been happening, happening in some places, that doesn't mean that people were alone that whole time. It doesn't mean they weren't sexually active during that time. And quite honestly, there were a lot of people who chose not to social distance or couldn't social distance. And so there could be continued exposures and continued infections where people weren't getting screened, they weren't getting tested, they weren't seeking treatment. Um, and then the impact of delayed diagnosis, I think that, I really think that's probably, I mean, this is all conjecture and certainly Dr. Wayand and Dr. Murphy, anyone else want to jump in here? When we see that spike happen, I know here in Athens, you know, right around like July, I don't know if any of you, were any of you here in school during that July? 
lot of people's parents got tired of them being at home <laughs> and said, go back to school. We're paying for this apartment. Get out of here. And so a lot of people came together, and there was a lot of not social distancing happening. Well, there's nothing else to do, right? Nothing else to do, exactly. So we may have had some increase in transmission during that time. But also, you know, that is when people started being able to go to more in-person visits, started having their preventive care, started having their screenings. And like we had talked about, you know, if, if you have one person who had an infection and they had sex with one person in March, April, May, different people, right, every month, March, April, May, June, none of those people were getting screened and so they may have been spreading it to new partners and so the impact of those people not getting screened or tested and treated was just growing exponentially. So there are a lot of potential things that could have been affecting those numbers. Right, so somebody who's infected for a month can only yes. spread the infection so far. Yes. But somebody who's infected for six months yeah. has a lot more opportunity to spread that to other yeah. people, even if you factor in social distancing. Yes. If it was happening. So Ronan, you actually have a, a comment, and Jane, you have a comment from online. I was home with my parents. I didn't feel like I could own up to the fact that I snuck out, and once I knew, I wasn't willing to tell them. <laughs> well, it would appear you're not alone. No, you're not alone. <laughs> yeah, and I'd like to, I mean, obviously part of tonight is, 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 is interactive, and we want people to ask questions. But I understand that this is maybe a somewhat delicate topic that people might feel a little awkward asking questions about. So let me preface this by saying, if you ask any question, we'll assume you're asking it for a friend. Okay, so, so you can ask the question for your friend and it'll be okay, so, so don't be afraid to do that. So, okay, I, I kinda wanna go back to something that you said and maybe Nathan, you can talk a little bit about this. Uh, you mentioned asymptomatic, right? So what does that mean, Nathan, if you're, if you're asymptomatic? So it means you're without symptoms. And you're walking around, you don't feel sick, you feel healthy, and you might have a normal sex life. And, and is that common for these type of, of sexually transmitted infections? Yeah, uh, so asymptomatic infections are a big contributor to uh, dissemination of these pathogens because people don't know they're infected and so they, they can easily transmit them. And asymptomatic uh, carriage also uh, contributes uh, to persistence of these uh, STIs in human populations because people don't seek treatment because they don't know that they are infected. Okay, so somebody can maybe have sex with another person, become infected, not know they're infected, and there's no symptoms, right? There's no pain, there's no discharge, there's nothing like that. And, and is asymptomatic carriage more common in men? Is it more common in women? Is it, is, is, are there any ideas about that? Are, people who have penises, people who have vaginas? Yeah, so in regards to Neisseria gonorrhea, uh, one of the common symptoms for that is a, a purulent discharge is what it's called. So it's like kind of an opaque fluid uh, that's discharged and there's, it's, it can be painful. And so this is in males. And so there's pain upon urination in males. So um, gonorrhea infections in males are typically recognized by the males and then they seek treatment. In women, uh, asymptomatic infections are much more common and so, but their asymptomatic, asymptomatic carriage happens in males too. So both sexes can disseminate the organisms due to asymptomatic infection. Yeah. Okay. Have we got any questions? Yes, we have a hand up. Thank you. So obviously, I'm asking for a friend. <clears throat> Sorry. I'm asking for a friend, obviously. Okay. 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 <laughs> no, I, I was just curious about like what's the incubation time. Uh, after the first contact, for example, how long uh, do you develop symptoms? the incubation time between being the, the first infected and, and becoming the first sim symptoms, symptomatic? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to guess that that varies quite a bit, right? Yeah, so with chlamydia and gonorrhea, it can be detected on a test in about two weeks after exposure. It can be longer for syphilis. Um, it can be longer depending on the test used for some of those viral infections as well. But the point after which a person is infected and they become symptomatic varies, likely is very similar to when it could be detected, but, but could also be longer than that. Okay. Question in the front. Uh, following up in that question, uh, what is the window period where you are still negative but after but you can start transmitting the disease. You still don't have symptoms, 
Uh, okay, so after, so what is, what is the window between you can become infected and then you become infectious, correct? Is that what, that's what you're asking. Uh, again, uh, my thought on that is it's really going to vary depending on which uh, infection we're talking about here. Um, do either of you have any specific numbers on any of these specific infections? Uh, I'll mention some uh, studies in Neisseria gonorrhea. There, uh, th there is a human volunteer challenge model for ni studying Neisseria gonorrhea infections in males. Uh, it, and uh, it's a seven day model. And uh, so they infect men and they monitor them for seven days. And uh, they, they can detect symptoms in that uh, period. But oftentimes uh, there's no sign of symptoms uh, in males, but they're at the end of that course, they're treated with antibiotics and they're released. Uh, so, but uh, there's this quiescent phase after inoculation where some people show symptoms right away and other people, the, the organism just disappears for a period of time. So it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. It's, yeah. So, so there's not one answer for all these it, organisms it, and there's not even one answer for even one of the specific it, it really organisms. Can, it really can vary for each individual, oh. yeah. Okay. Um, one last question, Jane, and I'll, I'll come to you in one second. Uh, when we looked at the infection rates for chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis, we see them go up overall. But for HIV and hepatitis, we saw them go down. Do you, do you believe those numbers? Are those accurate? What, what, what are your thoughts on that? I don't believe those numbers because people are still doing the activities that lead to those infections, right? They're still sexually active. They're still using drugs. Um, I feel like I want to phone a friend here because we have some folks here who do a lot of testing for HIV and hepatitis B, but um, there's a lot of stigma around getting tested too, uh, especially getting tested for HIV. Like it is a frequent experience in clinic that I will offer to patients like, hey, it's your annual exam. You've been sexually active in the last year. You know, these are the tests I recommend. And people will say, oh, you can test me for the chlamydia and gonorrhea, but I don't need an HIV test. So people don't perceive that they are at risk of acquiring HIV. I think that we may see those numbers change in the future, you know, it will be interesting to see what the rates do uh, with time with people getting tested. Uh, just a, I want to add a comment to that is a lot of the STIs, uh, the infections don't happen one organism at a time. So people are often co-infected with multiple organisms at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I just wanted so, to So, so that. If, if the three bacterial infection rates are going up, it's highly unlikely that in reality, hepatitis B and HIV went down. Yeah, and we know that, you know, one of the indicators of um, substance use disorder and injection drug use is overdose deaths, and those have increased. A um, lot during the yeah, pandemic. Yeah, so we know that people are using drugs in ways that can cause transmission of HIV and hepatitis. So there, it might be no surprise over, you know, 2021, 22, to see those numbers kind of bounce back up and, and the real numbers to become known yeah, over I time. Not, I would not be surprised. And then, of course, th those people will have been infected for a long period of time without yeah. knowing that they were yeah. infected. Yeah. yeah. OK, there was, there was a question up here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is there uh, any specific uh, infectious dose that we consider it that uh, this infectious dose, it is uh, effective or it is asymptomatic in this person, but it is symptomatic in another person? So is there any specific dose? Or that it depends on the physiology of the body? So an, an infectious dose that would make it be asymptomatic versus symptomatic? Is, yeah. that, is that the question? Yeah. That's a good question. I, I don't really know. And I think my thought is that that's probably just going to vary on an individual basis. Um, do, Nathan, any, 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 any further thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I don't have any specific uh, information on that. But it's a good question. There are studies where people will try to quantify the, the load of these different organisms in a clinical sample. And so, but I, I don't know the, the, the details. I mean, it's, it, it, it's worth mentioning that, you know, when you're looking at transmission of sexually transmitted infections, it's really hard to recruit volunteers for those kinds of studies, right? Um, for many of these pathogens, gonorrhea is a really good example. It only infects humans. There is no other animal that you can infect with this. So there is no good way to model this or to test this in a lab. You would have to do it with humans. And, you know, that's, like I say, somewhat challenging to, uh, to get a number of recruits to, you know, look at a gonorrhea transmission study, right? Yeah, so 
there is this scientific literature on this human volunteer challenge model for Neisseria gonorrhea. So you could consult that literature to see what levels of uh, the organism Neisseria gonorrhea were achieved over time. Uh, yeah, so, um, but as Ronan said, we, we can't do this, the studies in humans uh, past that uh, seven days because it's ethically, it's not responsible. And doing this model in females is, is not acceptable because the sequelae of infection are much more serious in women. So uh, Neisseria gonorrhea can ascend the reproductive tract and cause scarring in fallopian tubes and promote ectopic pregnancies and, and uh, infertility or sterility. And so there's, there's no human experimentation with Neisseria gonorrhea in females for the, because of those serious complications that are possible. But, but in males, it's uh, less of an issue, but it's still a very mon uh, controlled uh, s protocol for that type of study. Okay, um, so I'm gonna move on a little bit. Uh, and so I, I think, I, I guess the take home from all of this is, is let's not believe the numbers from 2020, right? They're probably not super accurate. Uh, and over the next few years, we're gonna see really how those numbers kind of level, level themselves off. Okay. So the next thing I want to talk about is a study that actually just was published um, by the NIH this month. Um, so as we've said, the three of those nationally reportable sexually transmitted infections are bacterial, chlamydia, syphilis, and gonorrhea. And so antibiotics, we all know what antibiotics are. They can be used to treat bacterial infections, uh, and they can be. Uh, but this study that came out literally last week uh, was a, a study that was designed it's called a post-exposure technique. They called it doxypep. So the idea here behind this study is they took uh, patients, they, they took people, uh, and within 72 hours of them having condomless sex, they gave them the antibiotic doxycycline, an oral antibiotic. The idea here being post-exposure treatment with antibiotic could reduce the rate of infection with chlamydia, syphilis, and gonorrhea, okay? So everybody with me, you get the idea how this works, right? So take the antibiotic after the event happens, right? The results from this study showed about a two-thirds reduction in the incidence of syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia in the, in the test population where they were given this antibiotic compared to their control population. So this is really good. This is really exciting, right? You can treat people post-exposure with antibiotics. And there's a quote here from one of the members of the research group. This is an encouraging finding that could help reduce the number of sexually transmitted infections in populations most at risk. So, Nathan, this is a great result, right? There's, there's no downside to this. We now have a, a, another way to, to potentially treat infections, right? Uh, it is a great result, but before I get to a possible downside, I, I do want to mention like what I like about this study. Uh, so, they looked at different anatomical sites in their study groups. And they found a drop in uh, urethral infections, pharyngeal infections, and rectal infections for these STIs. Pharyngeal infections? Yeah, so that would be a throat infection. Okay, so these uh, pathogens can colonize multiple anatomical sites or mucosal surfaces in the human body. And these sites, infections at these sites contribute to that concept of asymptomatic uh, carriage that's prevalent. And so when, when these infections get treated, the clinician has to consider the whole body and try to prescribe uh, an antibiotic that will treat infections at multiple anatomical sites. Okay. Uh, so, so I was encouraged that they saw this because in my mind, um, you know, after taking uh, an antibiotic uh, after uh, exp exposure, a possible exposure, uh, due to sexual activity, uh, they saw this drop. And it, it could be that it, that antibiotic helps uh, prevent establishment of an infection. Uh, but they also noticed that they did uh, recover some uh, Neisseria gonorrhea and Staph aureus, another uh, bacterial pathogen that were resistant to the drug they treated with, doxycycline. And uh, I'll mention there's a, there was a study in uh, 2017 in, uh, in France where they treated an individual with uh, pharyngeal or throat uh, gonorrhea uh, with uh, doxycycline and another common drug and uh, the, the treatment failed. And so uh, uh, these pathogens, they have the ability to develop resistance to the drugs we use very quickly. 
And there's a history of drug treatments in this country, and we, after introduction of an antibiotic to treat an infection over a period of maybe five to 10 years, usually the, the drug is discontinued because resistance has grown to such a high level. Well, it's funny you mention that because uh, this is the bacteria that you work on, right? Neisseria gonorrhea. That's right, yeah. And uh, can you talk us through, well, on, on the top slide, we're looking at antibiotic resistance, and then on the bottom, it's kind of relevant to what you just said about different antibiotics, right? Yeah, so currently the, the uh, recommended treatment in the United States and uh, is uh, one dose of ceftriaxone, and that, it's actually a 500 milligram dose. And it used to be, uh, just recently, within the last two years, we had a, a cocktail of antibiotics, uh, ceftriaxone and azithromycin to treat gonorrhea infections. Uh, but now we're just using uh, ceftriaxone. And so, uh, so... So what we're looking at here, yeah. just for, for people who maybe are not that familiar with it, we're looking at what percentage of infections, gonorrhea infections, and then different antibiotics that are used to treat them, right? And so what you can see here, starting from, you know, the, around 2010, moving forward is almost every gonorrhea infection is treated with ceftriaxone. There's barely any other antibiotics being used. Now, that's not just preference, right? That's not because physicians prefer ceftriaxone, right? See, Jane is shaking her head there. This is out of necessity, right? Because not much else works. Yeah, and this is a challenge because sometimes just having one option is really bad because some people have allergies to specific drugs and so they can't, they have to find alternatives to these. I'll, I'll draw your attention to penicillin in the little black box on the left there. That uh, antibiotic was introduced, you know, in the, in the 30s and, uh, but soon after that, you know, so it was, it was effective for treating Neisseria gonorrhea infections for, you know, a little over a decade. Uh, but resistance was de detected quite quickly after introduction of penicillin for treatment. And so it's just a common, it's just a, a catch-up game. Uh, there's this constant war going on between clinicians and the, the pathogens we're trying to treat. They <laughs> Jane, what happens if we can't use ceftriaxone for gonorrhea anymore? That's a great question. So... So there are alternative regimens. They're likely less effective than ceftriaxone. I think one of the changes that was made recently is, that, like Nathan said, the dose increased. So the dose that we use now to treat it, and we also recognize that people who have larger sized bodies may need higher doses as well because it takes longer for the drug to get distributed in their tissue to an extent that it would kill the infection. But um, you know, if we don't have new antibiotics being developed that can cure gonorrhea in particular, we're looking at a possible world where there are people with the sequelae of having an untreated gonococcal infection or a gonorrhea infection, and you know that can cause joint disease, it can cause bloodstream infection, it can kill people, um, but right now, what we have seems to be working. Because these infections existed before antibiotics, right? And, yeah. and their treatment yeah. was difficult. They could yeah. be prolonged, they were painful, mm -hmm. they were just difficult to, to get rid of, right? And ceftriaxone is only available as an injection. So there's a concept in treating sexually transmitted infections called expedited partner therapy. And that's where if you are diagnosed with an STI, but your partner doesn't have access to medical care or they're not willing to come into a clinic to get tested and treated, that you could get sent home with a prescription to give to your partner. Otherwise, that person's just going to get reinfected. So expedited partner therapy was legalized in Ohio a few years ago. It's been legal in other states for a longer time. But if you have a EPT for gonorrhea, you can't send somebody home with a shot to give to their partner. So right. one of the second line regimens is often what's used an oral drug in a similar class called cefixime. And then if people have a ceftriaxone or a cephalosporin allergy to any of those ceph drugs, there's another regimen, but it may not be as effective. Okay. So, so I mean, I guess the scary thing here is we are not, we're, we're, we're maybe one antibiotic away from a pan-resistant strain of Neisseria gonorrhea that is basically untreatable. I see a hand up in the audience here. We've got a question for your friend. Yes, thank you. Uh, no, it's for me this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, where is the um, vaccine research uh, on gonorrhea? Vaccine we, research? Yeah, are we close to, far away? Uh, is it something that you know people are uh, investigating? Any thoughts on that? I didn't hear the question. Uh, vaccines, vaccine research on for gonorrhea. Oh. Where, where, where has there been any, where, where does that stand? Yeah, so there's a big focus on 
uh, trying to develop vaccines right now uh, for Neisseria gonorrhea. That would be ideal uh, to not have to rely on antibiotics to treat these types of infections. Uh, so there, there is a lot of effort uh, being made by various groups throughout the world to do that. But it's, it's very challenging. Uh, so like uh, HIV, it's been challenging to make a vaccine for because it changes how it, the, its surface, how it appears to the host. And Neisseria gonorrhea does, has similar mechanisms where uh, an immune response may develop antibodies that, that can kill a, a portion of the Neisseria gonorrhea population in an infected person, but it doesn't kill the whole population because it changes and can resist or evade immune defenses. So it, it's a, some uh, STIs, uh, the organisms that cause those STIs are, are very wily or tricky. They change how they look to the immune system and it, it can be challenging to make vaccines for them. I have a question for you, Nathan. So we have <clears throat> vaccines against other Neisseria species, right? Neisseria meningitidis, which is a common cause of bacterial meningitis, which is deadly. Is that Neisseria species very different from Neisseria gonorrhea in how it behaves and how it's able to evade immune um, responses? Uh, so there's, uh, they are, they're highly related and they have different, they have, they share many mechanisms for evading the immune system. Uh, some of the vaccines uh, that have been really uh, effective for Neisseria meningitis infections uh, target a capsule, which is expressed by Neisseria meningitis, and Neisseria gonorrhea doesn't express a capsule. And these capsular-based vaccines are very effective at clearing uh, infections, uh, and, but we don't have that tool for Neisseria gonorrhea vaccines. So they're, they're making what's called a multi-subunit vaccine where they have multiple uh, antigens or bits from Neisseria gonorrhea to stimulate antibodies to multiple factors in the organism to try to clear it. Nathan, I want to go back to something that you mentioned a, a, little, a little while ago, because it's something that maybe not everybody is that familiar with. So when we think about sexually transmitted infections like gonorrhea, syphilis, chlamydia, I think a lot of people know that you know, sexual activity like, like penetrative sex, for example, is a way that can be transmitted. And I think people know that ways to prevent that are, you know, abstinence, obviously, um, but if you wear a condom, for example, barrier method, that's a, that's a way to prevent that. But, but something people may not be quite as familiar with is this idea of pharyngeal transfer, okay? Um, you know, activities such as oral sex would be maybe by some people considered safe, something that they can do and not necessarily need to worry about it. But it would appear from what you were saying earlier that that's not, not the case, right? Uh, when it comes to pharyngeal transfer, is that right? Yeah, I, I would agree with that uh, sentiment. Uh, yeah, oral sex is, can transmit uh, these organisms are very effectively. And so they can uh, live for prolonged periods within the oropharynx, the, the nasopharynx? Yeah, one study I saw recently, they, they estimated the time of uh, persistence in the throat at 16 weeks on average. 16 for, weeks. For Neisseria gonorrhea. And it, it can be longer, yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna kind of just pivot over to our friends uh, at Equitas Health here, Emily and Gabriella. So uh, at our table over here, I think we've got some, some of those barrier methods that can be used to prevent these kinds of infections. So you, you guys have some condoms, you also have dental dams, right? And that's sort of relevant to what we just talked about. It's maybe not something people automatically think of, is that you know oral sex is not a safe, completely safe way where you cannot get uh, transfer of, of these types of pathogens. So um, you guys have some of that stuff there. You also have some information uh, brochures about the appropriate use, how to use them properly, and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. So feel free to wander up there at the end. Another question up the back. Are there any specific, like, other antibiotics that are being researched as, um, if, I think it's called cefotriaxone, one day inevitably becomes resistant to gonorrhea? Are there others that researchers are looking into? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is something that we, all microbiologists, we talk about this a lot. Um, the simple realities are, no, not enough. Um, you know, if you go back looking at the history of antibiotics, you know, the 40s, 50s, and 60s, there was a lot of new antibiotics developed. It was really easy. You know, people were going out to their garden, digging up bacteria in the soil, and, you know, plating them, and boom, you got a new antibiotic. It was really that easy. But we've really exhausted a lot of that low-hanging fruit. And... The, the example I give in, when I teach this in class is, 
if you're, if you're the CEO of a pharmaceutical company and you are investing money to design a new drug, if you develop a new antibiotic uh, and it's prescribed for a patient, they'll take it for 10 days. Maybe one pill, two pills every day for 10 days, and that's how much you sell. Or you could invest your money somewhere else in medication that treats high blood pressure or erectile dysfunction, a pill that somebody will have to take every day for the rest of their lives, okay? Financially, as a CEO of a pharmaceutical company, where are you gonna put your money? And that's exactly what happens, right? Most major pharmaceuticals are not in the antibiotic drug discovery business anymore because it's just not financially viable for them. And so every year we see less and less new antibiotics being developed. Uh, in response to your question, though, there, there are uh, new antibiotics being clinically tested right now. And uh, some of them, I, I just wanted to mention, like, one of the challenges of identifying a new antibiotic is, is resistance can arise quickly in some settings. Uh, there are some drugs that have been found that uh, it looks like resistance is hard to form. And so th those are really exciting, but they're difficult drugs to find. Uh, but this, there was a test done on a particular antibiotic uh, recently for Neisseria gonorrhea, and it was efficacious against uh, a genital infection and a rectal infection, but not not pharyngeal or a throat infection. And so this is a this is a challenge. Uh, the the throat uh, oftentimes the antibiotics don't penetrate the tissues there as well as other sites. And so these types of things have to be studied and tested and can complicate uh, long-term success with a newly introduced antibiotic. And, and kind of it, going off of that, the concept of doing pharyngeal screening for gonorrhea, so remember screening is doing a test in an asymptomatic person, is at this time in the United States only recommended by the CDC to be done in people who are men who have sex with other men. So it's not recommended to be done on people with vaginas. Um, at their yearly visit. Um, same thing with rectal testing. And people who don't have symptoms, rectal testing at this time is not recommended. But I think that's really interesting what you're saying about the difficulty with you know, pharyngeal reservoirs and the difficulty of antibiotics to penetrate the pharyngeal space with a gonorrhea infection. You know, we probably have a reservoir of people who have throat gonorrhea infections, but they're not getting screened, they're asymptomatic, it's not being recommended. So it's interesting, I wonder if that's, you know, one of those things where, you know, the CDC looks at the public health pros and cons, cost versus benefit, um, but that may be something that changes in the future because of this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, just leading off of that, move on a little bit to talk very quickly about syphilis. And I know we don't have too much time left, but you guys have probably seen a lot of media coverage of this. The rates of syphilis in the United States have been skyrocketing over the last 20 years, right? This is like just a graph showing you the total number of syphilis uh, cases in the US over the last 20 years. Um, but this is what I wanted to bring up was it kind of gets to the point that you were, you were just making there, Jane. If we look uh, at the groups who are most frequently infected with syphilis, men who have sex with men, or MSM, has been the, the largest group here over the last five or so years. But if you look at 2020, and I don't know how much the pandemic has influenced this, women have gone from being the least infected group right up to the second most commonly infected group here. Um, and so this kind of gets to your point where you're saying that in the past, these screening has only been something that's recommended for men who have sex with men. You know, it, I think it, when you look at information like this, it really kind of adds to that maybe we need to reevaluate those kinds of screening uh, guidelines. Yeah, and if you look at syphilis recommendations, who should get screened for syphilis, um, we look at men who have sex with men. The CDC recommends that they get tested regularly or screened regularly for that. And pregnant women, but not non-pregnant women. It's not routinely recommended as a screening. Um, and I wonder where the level has to be before the CDC says, maybe we should be recommending this screening. Uh, right, and in because- all women, not just pregnant women. Because as we know, in, in, along with syphilis rates, one of the 
kind of most horrible things that we've seen in recent years is a, is a huge rise in congenital syphilis rates, right? Can you tell us a little bit about what congenital syphilis is? Yeah, congenital syphilis is when a person who is pregnant has syphilis. The syphilis bacteria crosses the placenta, can infect the fetus. And so you have a baby born with congenital syphilis. Syphilis, it can cause all kinds of birth defects malformations, things like that. Um, that's one of the reasons why it is uh, one of the prenatal testing panel tests that is done on pregnant women uh, early in pregnancy, and then if a woman is perceived to be either at risk based on you know, partner's practices or geographic location, they might do the test again before delivery. Right, and so if we look at CDC's numbers for congenital syphilis, since the 40s we saw a, a really sharp decline there's a little bump here around the 90s. That's actually due to a difference in how they reported this. But if you look over here into the 2020s, we're starting to see this increase. And if I just blow up the last 20 years, this is what's happening here. We are seeing this very, very sharp increase in the number of congenital syphilis births here in the United States. From 2020 to 2021, this is a 21 or 24% increase. I mean, this is huge. And this is something that's entirely preventable, right? Um, and if you look, uh, if you break down the, dem uh, the, the um, you know, we're looking at the prevention opportunities here of these, you know, approximately 2,300 cases, you know, where, where intervention would have been possible. The largest group here is there was no timely prenatal care and no timely syphilis testing. So it kind of gets back to the, what the point you just made about, you know, they only test pregnant women, but how many women made it like through their pregnancy maybe without knowing they were pregnant for a long time and then not getting tested even throughout that pregnancy? That seems to represent the largest group here. Um, so access to medical care really seems to have a, a big impact here on these congenital uh, syphilis cases. The second largest group is no adequate maternal treatment despite receiving, uh, uh, receipt of a uh, timely diagnosis. So that's somebody who is tested but then doesn't get access to medical care. So again, for these two largest groups that we see in here, access to medical care really seems to be a huge, uh, a huge contributor to that. Okay, let me throw this out. Any more questions in the audience? Yes. Why don't you just use mine? So if uh, one would be here in campus at Ohio University or lives in Athens and would like to get tested for STDs or HIV, <laughs> what would they do? I didn't set that up, but, uh, but that was in fact going to be the very next thing that we talked about. So uh, yeah, obviously the big take home from all of this is getting tested, right? And part of why we're talking about this is to try and remove stigma. We, Jane's already mentioned this, and we all know it. There is a stigma about sexually transmitted diseases and getting tested. So Jane, can you tell us a little bit about what our options are on campus? For sure, on campus, so at the Student Health Center, we offer testing. Um, we actually have a menu where a person can read through what body parts, the test, how much, how much they cost if they wanted to get billed to insurance versus if they wanted to pay out of pocket for it. Um, and then the patient would just select which test they want to have, and those tests would get done. Some of them are blood tests, some of them are genital tests, some of them are urine tests. Um, and so that testing is all available there. And, and am, am I going to get a letter in the mail to my home that my mom can open and see my results? Or uh, these are all done no, anonymously? We're, you know, we're in the 2020s. There's computers now, Ronan. Oh, okay, so, good to know. Um, in our clinic, we use, um, Ohio Health uses Epic, and so all patients have access to something called MyChart. And so their results get posted into their MyChart. And so unless the patient has given their parent access to that <laughs> password for their MyChart, Which is your choice. only the patient would see the results there. And so a question I had was, okay, obviously the last three years we all got very familiar with doing at-home testing, right, for COVID. Are there, are there options that for at-home tests for there any of these? There are. Yeah, there are. And we were talking about them recently, and I was doing a little reading about them. So the only FDA-approved at-home STI test is for HIV. Okay. There are other options available for doing um, at-home STI testing. There's a whole variety of packages. You can just do a Google search of like at-home STI testing, but none of those are FDA approved to be collected at home and sent into a lab. So nobody's like validated how sensitive they are, et cetera. Some of them have the opportunity, if you do have a positive test, to get connected with a, a virtual 
health person like a doctor or a nurse practitioner, but other ones don't. Um, but really the only ones that have been approved as FDA at-home tests are the HIV ones. Okay, but 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 options, non-FDA approved options yep. do exist for they somebody do. who just cannot yeah. bring themselves yeah, to walk like into the clinic. Yeah, like it could be a you know, self-collected swab, it could be a urine sample, it could be a finger stick. Um, there's all different ones. Okay, and we do also have non-campus testing options as well. Yes. So with Equitas, uh, you guys do testing for HIV and hepatitis C, okay? And I can tell you now, um, the, hep the HIV testing, it's, a, it's like a two minute HIV test. I actually did one here, the five minutes before we started this presentation tonight. It took like literally, two, and it took me longer to fill in the paperwork than it took to actually do the test, right? Very much like the COVID test that you're all familiar with, you know, one dot tells you the test worked, two dots would be a, would be a, a positive, right? So very quick, very easy to do. I survived, I'm alive. You know, there's nothing wrong. It's okay, you can do a test. It's, it's really not the end I of the I heard world. you say, that didn't even hurt. It didn't. It was a finger stick, and mm -hmm. I didn't even know she had done it. It was that easy, right? And I so. want to also say that other options, so if a person is not a student, you could just go to your healthcare provider and request STI testing. So any primary care practice can do that testing, any gynecology practice as well. And even in some urgent cares, we'll do that testing. Yes. <laughs> Does that mean that people who are here in the audience can have an HIV test tonight? Potentially. I, I, we talked about this. We don't have a whole lot of tests here tonight. There are a few small numbers. So if somebody really, really, really wanted to, we can do that. We don't probably have enough to do everybody in the audience. But, uh, you know, yeah, potentially. But if you're interested in that, I certainly want, uh, recommend you guys talk to, uh, talk to Emily and Gabriella afterwards. Yeah. We also have um, a QR code that you can scan here tonight to get scheduled with an appointment with me as well. It just also conducive to space and privacy. That's also another reason. Um, so there's that option. But then I also have what um, Dr. Babel was talking about, the at-home HIV test. Um, OHIV.org, which is an arm of our agency, Equitas Health, will actually mail you a free HIV test anytime you need it. So you can grab one of those cards as well. Just have one mailed to your home. Awesome, thank you. All right, final roundup. Do we have any final questions from anybody? I have one up here. I'm gonna, I'll run up to you. Hey, thank you. So um, when you were presenting, you talked about the fact that some of the STIs are not necessarily like sexually transmitted. So um, and you also mentioned the screening versus testing. When do you think is like, how often should you randomly test is it like right after you think you've engaged in sexual activity so you have to go and check or you can just randomly check? That is such a good question. It really depends on the test, right? So the soonest that a person would get tested would be no sooner than two weeks after sexual activity to get tests for like chlamydia and gonorrhea. They could get tested for syphilis at that time as well. They could have a blood test for a new HIV infection, but that would be a very expensive way to get tested. And usually we would recommend that you wait four weeks after uh, sexual activity to have an HIV test. And really um, a person could do screening or testing any time after they've had a new partner, um, as if they don't know that partner's status of infection. So um, for some people, they choose to get tested yearly. For some people, they choose to get tested any time they've had a new partner or before they're going to have a new partner. Um, so there are a variety of options available. Yeah, it's probably on an individual basis. Yeah, right? for sure, for yeah. sure. And I wanna say one other thing too. When you talked about what 20% of people in the United States have STIs at any given time, the most common uh, STI in this country is HPV, human papillomavirus, and that is a vaccine preventable STI. And so um, it will be really interesting to see as uptake of the HPV vaccine in this country increases in people 
who are younger than sexually active age and sexually active age, if we start to see reduced rates of HPV infections as well. And that's a relatively new vaccine yep, over the last... relatively, mm -hmm, and highly effective. And it, it's, it prevents cancer because cervical cancer, many uh, throat cancers, especially in younger people, uh, and anal cancer, penis cancer, vagina cancer, there are many cancers that certain HPVs can cause, and the vaccines prevent the two that cause the vast majority of those cancers. All right. Okay. Well, thank you all very much for coming. I hope you've all learned a lot tonight, and uh, we'll stick around for some questions afterwards.